Good morning, everyone. Good morning. If we open our Bibles to Psalms 24, division, Psalms 24. And we're going to start at the ninth verse. Psalms 24, the ninth verse reads, Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. May the word of God dwell richly in your heart and soul this morning. Amen. Amen. Our New Testament scripture comes from 2 Corinthians 13th chapter. 2 Corinthians 13th chapter, starting at the 11th verse, we find these words. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind, live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people are sent their greetings. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we come this morning, Heavenly Father, on this joyous day for we have another opportunity for on this day to worship you, Heavenly Father. For this is the day that you have made, and we are going to rejoice and be glad in it. We come to thank you, Lord, for allowing us to have another opportunity to celebrate with one another on our church anniversary. Heavenly Father, 91 years, the, uh, uh, the matriarchs of this church, the founders of this church started, Heavenly Father. And we are still here today. Oh, Heavenly Father, through pandemic and through other issues, Heavenly Father, but we are still giving you all the praise and all the glory and all the, uh, uh, the blessings that you can give to us, Heavenly Father. We want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for everything, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord, for the officers of the church. Thank you, Lord, for Reverend Ananias, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord, for the ushers. Thank you, Lord, for the, uh, the choir. Thank you, Lord, for the musicians. Thank you, Lord, for everything, Heavenly Father. We are here, Heavenly Father, to make a joyful noise and to give thee the praise and to give thee the glory, Heavenly Father. We're going to worship you this morning, Heavenly Father. We're going to shout this, Father. And we're going to show, Heavenly Father, the love for one another. Oh, gracious God, we ask this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we continue in your name this morning. We give you thanks, O oh, gracious God, for this opportunity that you've given us to come this morning. We thank you, O oh, Heavenly Father, that we're able to praise you and magnify your name as we've done. We pray, Lord, that we'll continue to make a joyful noise throughout this morning, worshiping you and praising you for what you have done. We give you the glory, Lord. And we give you the honor and we worship you in your great and majesty name. And may we continue in your son's name we pray. Amen.
calling me Those simple things That I, I once knew, Lord The memories are drawing me I must confess That I, I've been blessed but still my soul is not satisfied. Renew my faith. Restore my joy. And, and dry, dry my weeping eyes. Take oh, take me back. going to read the history of church of all of it I'd like you to read in silence as I read it to all. In June of 1930, Reverend Ernestine Jones, missionary of the Western Baptist Association of California, called a meeting to organize a mission in Ventura. Seven Christians respond to the call with assistance of Reverend H.B. Thomas of Santa Barbara other ministers and encouraging members from Santa Barbara's church. The mission was formed. This was the beginning of a vision of Sister Berth Bowling Wade and Sister Sarah Birch, that God wanted a church planted in Ventura for those who loved the Lord. Sister Bertha Bowling Wade committed her home to prayer meetings. After six months of continued prayer, the mission grew to 17 members. Six were dedicated individuals were baptized. This was a period of great rejoicing as it seemed God had honored 
the prayers of those who regularly gather to worship. Oliver Baptist Mission was organized in December of 1930. The name of Oliver was chosen because many members have come from Oliver Baptist Church in Chicago. The first official site of the mission was donated and built by the generosity of Sister Bowling Wade. The newly established church flourished under the efforts of many pastors who traveled from Los Angeles and Santa Barbara volunteering their service until a pastor was called. The Reverend I. H. Wallace was the first official, officially appointed pastor of all of it. Many, many ministers who followed him contributed to the growth of all of it and established an institution where people develop social and spiritually. Children of all of it have grown into adulthood and become leading citizens in our nations and community. Through many struggles, all of it has maintained the vision of the first pioneers who prayed without ceasing and generated a spirit of ongoing determination that would now allow for the fire, it would not allow the fire to die. Amen. Amen. Hey. Everybody say bless, say bless, bless, say bless, 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 Lightly, as a light in a dark land, since thou was placed in thy heart, all the Lord's commands. He set thee above nations and cast thy enemies away. He's standing up within thee, so let's proclaim today. We're blessed in the city, we're blessed in the fields, we're blessed when we come and we go. Just place it in his hands Felt the plots against it To try this morning
Good morning. Before we take the offering, I ask the officers to come forward. For those that are watching online, I want to let you know, again, as a reminder, this is an anniversary service. And even though you can't be here physically, you may want to participate in the giving. And if you do, um, you can follow the prompts online that would allow you to give your love gift to Olivet Baptist Church on their 91st anniversary. I just want to thank you forever and ever and ever for all you've done for me. And blessings and glory and honor, they all belong to you. Thank you, Jesus, for blessing me. I just want to thank you forever and ever and ever. Lord God is our waker, way maker. Amen. Amen. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. I worship you. I worship you, you're a way maker, 
way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Way maker, miracle worker, a promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Way make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, working in this place. you you are here moving in our midst I worship you I worship you for you are may way make way make miracle work promise keep light in the darkness my God that is who you are. Declare to the Lord, you're my a way maker, miracle work, a promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Way maker, way maker, miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness my god that is who you are we make we make a miracle work promise keep light in the darkness my god that is who you are we make miracle work promise keep light in the darkness my god that is who you are we make miracle work promise keep light in the darkness my god that is who you are we make miracle work Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. softly with me. Your way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. The way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, Light in the darkness, God, God, that is who you are. Be our light in the darkness, way make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, 
my God, that is who you are. Way maker, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Hallelujah. Good morning. Thank you, choir, for that. Appreciate that. Musicians also. Um, it's a special day today. I thought of the first song that you all sang, which was to take me back. And I sat there and started thinking, 1975, September 25th, Reverend Hunter, gospel presentation in the afternoon. And that's when my new life started. What an amazing thing. And now today, it's an honor and a privilege for me, I would do this if nobody showed up today, to sit in the pulpit and preach an anniversary service where I first started and received my eternal life. So that being said, I thank you for the opportunity and if you have your Bibles, do you have an outline? Okay. Uh, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to uh, one text, Second Timothy. And you want to keep your finger in uh, this uh, chapter 3, because we'll be working our way through it, uh, through the outline that I've provided for you. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. You ready? reading from the NIV version. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. Let's pray. Holy Father, again, we come before you. We thank you for the opportunity for this special day. 91 years is a long time. Most churches don't last that long. And yet you have placed your hands on this specific church, through a series of pastors, through a prayer group in Chicago, to 2021. In a day when a lot of people may think that the Bible is irrelevant, Holy Spirit, will you show us today? <laughs> it's more than relevant today, that you have a specific message for Olivet Baptist Church, not from the speaker, from your book. And that message will show the relevancy of the inspired word of God. And so, Holy Spirit, may you have your way this morning. May you take us back in history, but may you move us forward in the present and may you encourage all of us and give us hope and rekindle in our hearts our first love with you may you get the glory for everything that is done father elohim jehovah adonai may you three get the glory 
for today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I was preparing a sermon for this specific day, I was thinking of Psalm, and this is just my introduction, Psalm 143, um, verse 5. And we want, I think we, it's important we do this. 143, verse 5 says this, I remember the days of long ago. I meditate on all your works and consider what your hands have done. The part that uh, stood out to me was that the psalmist stated that he meditated on the past. He looked at what God had done in the past. That's what we're doing today in a way. We're looking at what God has done through a period of 91 years and we're going back and reflecting on the past. And by doing so, I think you and I can find and see God's blessings for the future. You and I will be able to see from what God has done in the past at all of it, his hand working then and now and even in the future to give you and I motivation, comfort, and encouragement. 91 years of history. So do you mind if I go back for a second? All of it Baptist Church started by two women in Chicago who migrated out here and started a prayer group. And from those two sisters, Sister uh, Bertha Bowling Wade and Sister Sarah Burke, followed a line of ministers whom God placed as under shepherds. 13 of them to be exact. And I think it's noteworthy to mention their names. Reverend Wallace was the first. And then you had following him, Reverend Thatcher, Reverend Wade, Reverend Bailey, Reverend Lovelace, Reverend Gentry, Reverend Kellum, Reverend Wilkes, Reverend Wiggins, Reverend Hunter, Reverend Baylor, from which I got taught quite a bit as his assistant, Reverend Bryce, and Reverend Gramley. Thirteen pastors. That's the past. That's history. As we reflect on it, we should be encouraged to see how God moved and continually provided Olivet an under shepherd. But did you know in the Bible that there was a church that was known for its love? The Ephesian church. And it only took them 20 years to lose it. 20 years and it was gone. So much so that Jesus in Revelation 2 verse 4 said, you all are doing a good thing. You're getting rid of these fruitcake preachers that come in trying to teach false doctrine. You're doing this, you're doing that, but I got one thing against you. You've lost your first love. 20 years and it's gone. The question is, that's for us today, what's God's message to all of it now? That was history. You look back and a lot of people still live in the past. They all talk about the good old days. The problem is the good old days are gone and we're in the present. So what's the message now for all of it? What is God saying December 2021 for this church? Does he have a message? He does. He's got a message for not only all of its anniversary service, but every church in America today. You could apply this text that we're going to unpack 
everywhere. My concern is it's never talked about in the pulpit. So it leads us to our theme. You have your outline. Let's go to work. The theme is what must the church realize today? We can make it really personal. What must all of it realize today? That's our theme. And the answer to it is in the theme, the warnings. What warnings? You mean that God has warnings for the church? Yeah. For today? Yup. And nobody talks about it. Why? If you have your introductory comments, let's take a look at them. This will set the stage. Number one, and you have it in the introductory comments, don't ignore the warnings from Jesus. Jesus had specific warnings that he gave for his church. I'm only picking one in light of time, but it'll prove our point. Don't ignore the warnings from Jesus. So he had several. We'll look at one. John 15, 18 through 21. John 15, 18 through 21. Ready? Here's what it says from the NIV version. If the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you, no servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. So what does this say? Sounds like John 17 almost to us. You have it under A1. The world hates you. That's the truth. The world hates the real Christian. And... It hates us. Those are the facts. You can ignore them if you want. You have a lot of Christians that want to be like the world, embrace the world, embrace its thinking. But the bottom line is this. You heard it from the one you sang about, and I sang about in my heart, Christ. And he said, you know what, Pastor Ananias, they're not going to like you. Not only is it they're not going to like you, they're going to hate you. Number two, don't ignore the warnings from John. Don't ignore the warnings from John. And we have our text in 1 John, which is right before Revelation, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. 1 John 2, verses 15 and 16. So yeah, don't ignore the warnings from Jesus. Don't ignore the warnings, number two, from John. And here's our text. Listen to what it says. Do not love the world or anything in the world. And we'll explain what that is later. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Verse 16. For everything in the world, the cravings and civil man, the lust of the eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. So now here's what we got setting us up. Jesus warns us, they're going to hate you. And then John says, don't love them. They're going to hate you. Don't love them. Now, those of you that have been coming already know that in your English Bible, when you look at the word world, there are three different Greek words that explain it. The sad thing is we only get the English word world. But in the Greek, what's translated world are three separate words. One 
is the universe, but that's not this word. It describes, when you say world, it'll mean the universe. That's not it. Then there's another Greek word that talks about the cosmos. It's translated world. This is not in your notes, but I'm giving it to you anyway. It's tra translated world. You know the magazine Cosmopolitan? That's where it comes from, and it means humanity. So when Jesus said in John, that, or John wrote it and said, for God so loved the cosmos, that's the word that's translated world in that text. In other words, God so loved humanity that he gave his son. But that's not the word here. The word here in this text that we're looking at means, translated world, means a secular way of thinking. A worldview on how you see life that's anti-God. So it's a mindset. In fact, when you think about it, think about this. The philosophy of that word means it incorporates values, pleasures, inclinations, philosophies, goals, drives, attitudes, actions of society. All of that is a way of thinking. And so when he says, do not love the world, he's talking about, do not love its values, its pleasures, its way of thinking, its goals, its drives. Don't think like them. And when you break it down, you really only have two options today. Any human being has, you either have a biblical worldview or you have a worldly or secular worldview. Those are the options. That's all you've got. And the one in the minority today is the biblical worldview. That's the one that most people do not embrace. For example, most people follow trends. You ever notice that? And trends are like, let's just throw out some examples, dress, hairstyle, morality. Most people think that those trends are isolated. They're not. It's an underlying philosophy that is worldly. My youngest daughter, I was talking to her, and I, and I said, you know, I pick you up at school, at high school. Man, those kids, we didn't dress like that. Oh, Dad, well, this is like 2021 now. Yeah, but we still, I get it, you know, but it, it's different. Well, Worldliness isn't so much something we do, although it shows up in that. It's something we believe. It's an attitude. It's a mindset. It's a philosophy. And look at letter B, small b in the introduction. 1 John 5, 1 makes a comment about who runs this way of thinking. 1 John 5, verse 19 Again, setting us up for what we're going to unpack. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Okay, so it's not the universe. It's not the cosmos. Those two words mean world, but that's not it here. It's the way of thinking and who controls the way of thinking? Satan using people to implement that. So clearly, every Christian, every church is in a battle zone. Like it or not, you're in a war. And it's in the spiritual realm. The guy that you're going up against is the guy that has this worldview that is anti-God and wants you and me to embrace it. The real battle is spiritual. But take note, all of it, the world hates you. Satan runs this system. And it violates a biblical standard. Those are the two warnings. And don't love it, John said. 
Now, why does Olivet, or for that matter, any other church need to be aware of these warnings? Because you don't hear it much today. But why should we be aware of it? Because the world wants to do our thinking for us. They want to tell you and I what to believe and why. Now, let me repeat that. The world and its way of thinking wants to think for you and tell you what to think and how to think and what to do. And Satan, who we just read, runs that system of thinking, wants to drive a wedge between you and God. Let me repeat that one. What Satan wants to do is get you and I as believers to embrace a world philosophy instead of a biblical philosophy so he can drive a wedge between you and your Savior. Now, let's go to work. Roman numeral number one. What must the church realize? We said it in the theme. The warnings. What warnings now? Roman numeral one. We got three under the warnings. So we're going to look at three warnings and we're going to go from general to specific. Here we go. Under letter A, the general warning. We read it in our opening scripture. Number one, difficult times are ahead. Or your Bible may say terrible times. So it's the same word translated the same way. Difficult times are ahead. We read the text, 2 Timothy 3, 1. That was the text. Paul wrote Timothy, a young pastor who was really close in their relationship. Paul knew he was leaving. And he knew they were coming. There's a specific group. And so he's warning Timothy. Terrible times are here, and there's an intensity in it. In that verse, you see it. In fact, maybe I should read it again because I want to underscore something for you. There is a statement that Paul makes, and it's really intense in that verse. So let me read it. But mark this. That's the intense part. That's what he's saying. He begins it by saying, but mark this. Literally, it reads, keep on knowing this, Timothy, and keep knowing it, and keep knowing it. It's in the present tense. It doesn't go away. It's ongoing. In the Greek language, if you get something in the present tense, that means keep on thinking it, keep on doing it, be aware of it, don't let it go. Realize, Timothy, terrible times are ahead. Let's make it personal. Realize all of it. It's not going away. Terrible times are here. And it's in the command form. A command in the Greek language means that it's not an option. It's not, well, it may happen. It's going to happen. It is happening. And it's going to keep on happening. So in other words, what he's telling every church and us specifically today is don't be naive, all of it. These times are going to be difficult. And the way you cure it is by learning to think. That's how you shut it down. If you don't think, the world will steamroll your thinking for you. And you, you hear it, the last days. You, you hear that in this text. And people seem to think it's prophetic. But remember we did that chart in prophecy? And that first bubble was the church age? And under that bubble, that's the last days. So we're living in them. It's not something that's going to happen years from now in the future. It's a present tense thing. We see it in verse 1 of 2 Timothy 3. That these last days are present days. It's the church age. These problems existed in the church when Jesus was there. 
and it exists today. And I find it really strange that pastors don't help their folks and warn them. That word terrible or difficult is only used one other time in the whole New Testament. Did you know that? That word, perilous times, difficult times, uh, depending on your translation, is only used in one other spot in the whole New Testament. It's in Matthew 8, 28, and it deals with the two demon-possessed men. Oh, and that word refers to someone who is dangerous, who is forceful, and they use the word play of an ugly wound. Okay, you ever seen uh, shows on TV where they show somebody that's got an ugly wound and it, you know, it's a burn victim or something and it looks bad? Here's what I want to do now. Let's apply the ugly wound. Because I just said it was present tense. It's today. It's difficult times today. And the church better be aware of it because it's not going away. So let's apply it. And you tell me if this is an ugly wound. Our major cities are unsafe today. In fact, where the two ladies that started Olivet Baptist Church in a prayer meeting in 1930 came from a city now that is a war zone and nobody talks about it. The homicide rate in cities across the U.S. today has increased. Stores have mass looting, and I'm watching the news, and I see five news people say, hmm, we got a problem. No kidding. You finally figured it out, but you still don't know what to do. So now you're having these little dialogue sessions. Look at who's running the city. You got these people that don't tell the truth. Telling me that a city is safe and 18 young black men died because they were shot. Huh? Look at the way they think. If you commit a crime, we won't. You can register and we'll let you out. So you don't have to worry about going to jail. And now these news people are trying to figure out why crime is up. Well, if you know you're not going to jail, it's a free for all. New York City's got a young lady in daytime on the subway. I said it last Sunday. I'm still irritated with it. She gets raped. Nobody helps her. But they take videos. That's the United States in which we live, that's ugly to me. That's an ugly picture, and it fits the word of the two demon-possessed men in Matthew. Remember, the enemy is spiritual, and he is behind all of this. You know how when you go to the store and they have warning labels? You put them on an on a item, and it'll say, warning, da-da-da-da-da. How would you, what type of label would you put on our culture today, our society? I tell you what I would think. I would put a label like this. Warning, difficult times are upon us and they're not going away. And all we have to do is look. It's in front of us. But the church, hmm, not doing a whole lot in exposing it. Why is that? That idea, that makes me think, well, how come? I mean, we see it every day. We won't even go certain places because of it, but it's never talked about. Letter B, that was the general warning. Now let's look at the specific warning that is for us today. Letter B, the specific warning, ready? You're going to laugh, but it's right here in the scriptures. 
Number one, difficult people ahead. So we got difficult times. Now you're saying difficult people, Pastor Ananias? I am. Let me give you the text. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 through 5. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 through 5. When was the last time you ever heard anybody talk about this? I mean, it really hits me. But let's look at it. I really wanted to address the, all of the words. It's a whole nother sermon. So I can't do it. So we're just going to run through them. I want you to see the type of people that Paul knew was coming and is trying to warn this young pastor. Here it is. People will be lovers of themselves. Like selfies, right? Lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents. Nobody talks about that, but it's is what's this is today. Ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Now look at the warning. Have nothing to do with them, Timothy. That's why there are difficult times. Doesn't it make sense? People make the times. If you got difficult people, you're going to have difficult times. They go warp and woof. They go together. So, all of it in any other church that is hearing this message don't be naive stay clear of these folks because they do damage so difficult times warning number two difficult people and it specifically lists how they are now let her see the third warning, the subtle warning, the subtle warning. We're going from general to specific now. The subtle warning. What do you mean by that? Talking about C1, be careful, Paul wrote Timothy. Why? Because of 2 Timothy 3, 4 through 5. And we read it. They're treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And they have a form of godliness, but no power. And you may say, sitting there, well, that certainly describes the world. But the church better be careful because they're inside too. Keep in mind, Paul wrote Timothy. He's a pastor. And he, Paul knows he's leaving and he's warning them not just about outside folks that are unsaved, but inside folks. It may surprise you, but when you look at 2 Timothy, Paul envisioned the trouble coming primarily from church folks. A form of godliness, but no power. That means they carry their Bible. They can say, praise the Lord. They can give you all the cliches. But true religion combines form and power. These folks have the form, but no power. And they're not talking worldly here. They're talking inside. So you got a bunch of people in the church today. They got a form of godliness, but no juice. The power's not in their life because it's fake. And Paul warns Timothy, avoid those folks. So now, I thought we were supposed to like interact with, with sinners. We're not supposed to go live on a mountain. That's correct. We're not. Be in the world, but not of it. But we're not talking sinners here. We're talking people that play a hypocritical game 
as a Christian. And Paul is warning Timothy, stay away from these folks. Okay, that sets us up, the warnings. Now, if you're like me, okay, Paul, I got it. You have these folks. What do I do now? Ready? Roman numeral two. How should the church react to the warnings? How should we, as a body, react to this type of situation, which, if we're going to be honest, you can't deny. They're there. So here we go. Under A, we're going to narrow it down again. Heed the warnings. In other words, listen to it, heed it, heed the warnings. Merely hearing of danger isn't enough. That doesn't do it, though. The church must do more than realize, okay, yeah, they're there, amen. We got to do more than that. So what do we do? And it leads us to number one. That means give the right response. Give the right response. Okay, let's ask another question. What's the right response? Takes us to letter B. Follow the scriptural reaction. You mean the Bible tells me how to respond to people like this? People outside the church and inside the church? It does. Give me the evidence. Here we go under B1, 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3, verse 13. 2 Timothy 3, verse 13. While evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Okay, so now let's take a look at some things. Under A. First, that's your blank, the first blank. First, Stay realistic in the appraisal of your times. That's the first thing we need to do as a church. Stay realistic in terms of appraising the times. Don't sugarcoat it. If he's making a statement, then take it as he's making it. We have a tendency to make excuses when we see things. And Paul is saying, Take this one the way I'm saying it, Timothy. So, look at the word evil in verse uh, 13. You see where it says, while evil men? So let me tell you what exactly um, that means. It means wicked, worthless, vicious. It means that you've got imposters that are in the body, and you better be heads up and don't be naive about it, they're outside and they're inside, and they're wicked, worthless, and vicious. Those are not very, com that's what the word means when you do a word study on it. And that word imposter means this, people who veer from correct instruction and lead other people into error. So now you've got wicked, worthless, vicious people that are imposters that want to deceive by leading people into error. Not right thinking. So, let me ask you this question. If we really believe in verse 13 is true, do you believe it's true? Okay. Then we will watch the news differently today. We'll look at the news and see, hmm, why do you keep pounding me on three topics over and over and over? What would you do if you came in here on Sunday and you got the same sermon over and over and over and over and over? You'd probably say, I'm not going there. I mean, what are you trying to tell me? I get it. That's the question. You should be asking the TV. When you look at the news and they're pounding the same topics over and over, and there's only three or four, watch for them. Start thinking and see when you can catch them. Then I'm sitting there going, what are you trying to tell me now? That's all the news? Three items? And you can turn the channels. I don't care which channel you turn. 
they're all saying the same thing. Hmm. How does that work? I thought that news people were to report the news and let me think. Not tell me how to think. Oh, so they're deceiving me maybe? Possibly. But what happens is when you start to apply this and think, you're going to see, you'll see through the facade. You'll hear, you see the other day I'm watching the news and I'm hearing a politician tell me the gas went down and he's showing me a chart. Huh? Uh, you, wait, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking, you must really think we're dumb. You're showing me a chart and the line goes like this and it drops and you're saying, see, gas is going down. And I'm thinking, what a hustler here. You're an imposter now. You're trying to work me by showing me a chart and you're expecting me, ready, to be naive and not think. When we start to think, you'll start to discern and see through this. And Paul is telling Timothy, be heads up, but don't be surprised. They're there. Don't act like it's a shock. Anticipate it. Assume it. Stay realistic. Call it what it is. Now, a lot of these imposters prey on churches. They do. I'll never forget the story when I first took this church in Compton. We had like four folks. All of a sudden, one day, this guy rolls up. Now, we only had a big parking lot, but we only had three cars because we didn't have very many folks. And up comes this white Cadillac. And the guy walks out with his wife. And he's got a briefcase. I'm going, this is interesting. And of course, when you have four folks, they're all excited when they see another warm body that's a human. Okay? And so everybody, whoa, we got a visitor. But something wasn't right in my discernment. So I'm just watching, right? Then the guy comes up to me later and goes, so how does this work? I said, how does what work? He goes, well, you know, you're not black and this is a black church. I said, it works like this. I'm the pastor and they're my folks. And then he says, well, I got a book for your folks. No kidding. And he goes, yeah, it's a cure for AIDS. And I want to sell it. I said, look, dude. Nobody's selling anything to these folks. Let me tell you something. These folks got raped on the last guy. It's not going to happen now. And I said, you're not selling anything. You're not going to be up in the pulpit. You're not going to be preaching here. In fact, I got a question for you. Where did you go to school? He said, Jamaica. Where in Jamaica? I said, because I got folks in Jamaica. And I'm going to check you out now. Because something's not right. He got really offended. And he goes, I've never had a guy talk to me like that. I said, look, dude, you want to bring the race card on me? You do it. I don't care if you're white, black, or purple. These four people are my folks now. And as long as I'm here, I'm going to protect him. So when I see you next Sunday, you better be telling me the truth because I'm going to find out. Long story short, I get a call from Utah from a friend of mine in ministry. He's telling me that he saw on the news, it wasn't 60 Minutes, but a program like that, about a guy that was leaving Florida hitting black churches in a white Cadillac and taking their finances. And I said, wait a second. I still remember the guy's name. Nehemiah Palmer. He goes, how did you know that? said, dude, he was at our place. So they pray even on churches. Some even lead churches. And you and I have to be aware and know it's potentially out there. And you and I need to be honest about it and know and not get shocked. Just be smart. Let her see. Well, how do we stay realistic? If you're telling us to be realistic, how do we do it? And the answer is 
2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. And what does he say? 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. Paul writes, But as for you, continue in what you've learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through the faith in Christ Jesus. So what Paul is telling them is, Timothy, you've been around me. You've had good teaching. Hang on to that. You've had a mother. By the way, did you know Timothy was an, I, an interesting ethnic mix? He had two people that hated each other. His father was Greek and his mother was Hebrew. And they hated each other. Now, how they got hooked up, it's one of those stories. But you don't hear much about the father, but his mother and grandmother were steeped in the scriptures. That's going to be a ticket for you and I to think about. And he said, Remember what they taught to. So it takes us to C, number A. The second thing is be convinced of the long-standing truths that you've been taught. Well, I'll give it to you again. Under A, second, be convinced of the long-standing truths you have been taught. We must hold fast to the word of God. You know what that means? Convictions. That means that the truth, which is Christ and the word, that you and I got to have convictions. Now, I'm going to give you a quote by a theologian named Chesterson. Here's what he said. I'll repeat it twice because it's a devastating quote. Tolerance is the virtue of the man or woman without convictions. Now, I'll repeat it again. Tolerance, you, anything goes, you're going to let it go, you won't say anything, is the virtue, means it's held up in high esteem, of the man or woman without convictions. Means they don't have any convictions. And to them, that's a high something to esteem. Now, can you imagine a person with no convictions that let anything go? But when I thought about it, Welcome to our society today. Because that's exactly where we're at. Truth is out. And I'm going to tell you what happens when we do it, when our society does it. But I see Christians more vocal about politics and race than I see them about the Bible. In fact, I was talking to a young lady, a teenager, just the other day. And I said, man, you're pretty aggressive with me when we're dialoguing, which I like. Let's talk politics. Let's go. You want to talk? Okay, let's go. But I'm going to apply biblical truths to it. And, and I said, so now let's talk. I said, you really, really got a, you know, a passion for this. I like it. Okay. Maybe you'll be a politician. And as we kept talking, I said, but you know what I've noticed about you? You'll talk about race. You'll talk about politics and you'll have a passion about it, but you don't have that passion about the truth. Why is that? You look at going to church as entertainment. You want the choir and the pastor to entertain you, and that's what you base it on. And if you get a feel good feeling, you think that's a good church. Well, I've got something for you. If you're not growing in the truth, these folks are going to hustle you that Paul's talking about. Because you don't have any foundation to put a hook on and fight back. So you should reevaluate what you're even doing. But why don't you have that passion for the gospel? It's the truth. Don't you find that's a thinking moment? How come these folks don't stand up? You hear these politicians pray 
And then when they pray at the end, they go, God bless America. Well, you want to shake them up? Why don't you say, Jesus bless America? When's the last time you've seen a president of the United States open up the scriptures and read from the Bible? Not in our lifetime. Hmm. Tolerance is the virtue of the man or woman without convictions. Letter D. Paul is telling Timothy, as we just read, stand on the word. Your mother and your grandmother knew it. I shared it with you, Paul said. Stand on it, Timothy, because the times are difficult. The people are difficult and they're coming. They're imposters. More so in the church he was concerned about than the outside. Remember, Satan comes as an angel of light. An angel of light means that when you look at it, unless you got discernment, you're going to get worked. Because it's light. So let's take a look at why he says stand on it. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is God breathed. Let's stop right there. I'll stick with that for now. Stand firm. So 1A. Third, stand firm. Why? Because it's inspired. God breathed. There's only one book in the world that you can say that about. And that's the Bible. It's inspired. So I got a shot at this. I've got man's truth or God's truth. Who's smarter? Yeah. So if he's saying, here's what, for example, if you're married, here's what women want to the guy. They want to be loved. They want to know that they're loved. Here's what a man wants. This is all Bible. He wants to be respected. That's what he wants. So now, guess what? In our fallen nature, guess what? I shared it again. I'll do it as an example of the relevancy of Scripture. We do the reverse. Ask a guy, do you find it easier to respect your wife or lover? And when I say love, I don't mean the warm, fuzzy feeling. I'm talking about the agape love that is defined in the Bible. Ask him. You know what they're going to say? I find it easier to respect her. Right. Because the biblical mandate is that you love her sacrificially. Ask a woman. You find it easier to respect your man or to love him? And if they're honest, they're going to say easier to love him. Yeah. Because in our fallen nature, that's right. We are mandated to respect him. Now, that's counseling from Scripture in a marital relationship. God's truth or man's truth? So, why should we focus on this inspired word of God? You have it. I'm going to give you three blanks there. Let's fill them. Because it's, first of all, it's revelation. That's the blank. It's revelation. And by, by that, I mean it's God giving his truth. God is revealing his truth. Revelation. So every time we look at the word, what we're doing right now is God's revelation to you and I in terms of his truth. It's revelation about who God is and what he demands from us. Number two, the second blank, inspiration. So you have God revealing his truth. Inspiration is man's writing of God's truth. Holy men of God pen the inspired word. It's inspired. How is it inspired? God inspired. So this should be the book of all books. I remember, I know you're going to think this is stupid, but my youngest daughter, I had a desk and I had my Bible on there. And then I said, just set it on my desk. And she set the paper on the Bible. Said, what are you doing? What? Take it off. This book is special. Well, don't put something on top of it. And she smiled. She got it. It wasn't like I was mad. I just said, what are you doing? But it was an object lesson for her. 
This is God-inspired truth. That means it's from him for you, and it's inspired to reveal his truth to you. The third blank, illumination. So you have revelation, inspiration, and the third thing, understanding on the word, is illumination. And that's where our being is enlightened by that truth. Remember how I pray every Sunday, you know, illuminate the text? That means let my being be enlightened. So that when we walk out here, we're going to go, whoa, God has spoken to me through the truth. So let's play the game out. Because I heard a, I read a story about a preacher in Hollywood at First Presbyterian Church. It's a famous church. And the son was the preacher, but he went on vacation. But his dad was even more of a heavyweight than the son. So he got in the pulpit and in the middle of the sermon, he goes, now, I, I couldn't do it, but he goes, you believe this? And he read, a, he read a, a statement, a promise. He got quiet, tore it out. Okay, let's eliminate it. Do you really believe this? Mink, long story short, he kept tearing out the scripture until there was nothing left. And he said, see, you can't pick and choose. It's all God-inspired. So let me, let's play this out. If the Bible is not inspired, let me play devil's advocate. If it's not inspired, let's say, or somebody's listening online, they go, I don't believe it's inspired. Okay, let's go with that. Then it's not authoritative. If it's not inspired by God, then it's not uh, authoritative. If it's not authoritative, then that means the commands and the things that are in it are on par with any other book at the library. Follow me now. With no inspired text, our only guide in life is our feelings. See it? And that's where we're at in a society today. It's how I feel, not what is true. That's where we're at today. And that's why people say there is no, okay, you eliminate truth, then the only thing you and I have to go by on whether or not something is true or false is our feelings. And I don't know about you, but feelings lie. Just, just last night, my youngest daughter knocked on the door. I didn't hear it. I'm working at my desk on the sermon. Then I thought, I should go and check the mail. So right when she's at the door and opening the screen door, I'm opening the door, not knowing anybody's there, and I jump back, and she starts laughing. I said, man, Athena, I, I mean, she's laughing at me because I've never seen you. I, I said, well, I opened the door. I'm not expecting a person. She said, you didn't hear me knock? No. My feelings lied. It's my daughter. I don't have to be afraid, but I was. See? And so if you and I only have our feelings, we're in trouble. Welcome to today's culture where people no longer look at the Bible as the inspired word of God. Truth is out. Feelings are in. That's why people say, look at this society. We measure everything by how we feel. I don't like it. You got people in a math class saying five times seven is 50. And then they're telling the teacher, well, it may be wrong, but that's how I feel today. You know, this is how I feel. Today, I'm a man. Tomorrow, I feel like a woman. The next day, I may feel like something else. No, objective truth, baby. It's the standard. Now, you can tell me you feel like a dragon, but truth says you're a guy. That's the DNA. That's the chromosomes. But you know who believed this as inspired? You ready? Jesus did. He called it God's word. Paul did. Solomon did. You know what amazes me? Everybody runs to man for his wisdom. And the smartest guy in the world wrote Proverbs and nobody goes to him. Isn't that interesting to me? 
It should be to you too. Why? Because you know what? The book is gone in our society today. They did a survey I was reading last night on Christian colleges, incoming freshmen. Guess what they found out? They don't even know the foundational truths of the Bible. Huh? So now I'm asking, what is the pastor preaching? If young 18-year-olds that want to go to a Christian college do not know the basics and are at the bottom of it, what is that saying about the church today? Letter E, we're almost done. You've been very kind. Allow the word to work. Allow the word to work. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 16. So let me finish reading it because we only stopped at the inspired part. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 16. And we'll move forward on this. And here's what it states. All scripture is God breathed. Okay, we did that. And is useful. Okay, I don't know about you. Don't you like practical things? If the preacher can't tell me how to apply it, I need to go somewhere else. You got to show me, man, how to do this stuff. So here we go. He's saying it's useful. For what, Paul? Paul's telling Timothy. Teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. There we go. Okay, let's talk about these really quick. Under A, first, allow the truth to fulfill its purpose. And its purpose is those four items. So let's you and I allow it to fulfill its purpose. Under one, you have it right following that statement. The benefits of the church having the inspired text. The benefits of the church having the inspired text text. You and I get benefits from its purpose. So here we go. You ready? We've got four and we're done. A, first, it's profitable for teaching. It's profitable for teaching. The source of truth comes from God and his word through his word. So it's profitable through te for teaching. B, second, it's profitable that means we get a payback from it for reproof, for reproof. So what does that mean? That means everybody thinks, well, you're getting in trouble. No, it doesn't mean that. It, here's what it means. It's an objective standard that God sets for you and I so that you and I are enabled to distinguish between what is right and what is wrong. That's what it does. No subjective truth. That's not how I feel about something. God's word is a standard, the standard. It allows you and I to measure everything. You get to measure preachers by this book. Not how you feel, but what God's word says. You're able to measure education by it. You're able to measure people by it. You're able to measure a potential spouse by it. See, anything, I don't care what it is. You're able to measure what is good parenting. You're able to measure what is counseling, whether it's secular or biblical. All of these are there for you and I. Third, let her see. Third, it's profitable for correction. Now, I did a quick word study for you on that. You know what that word correction means there? It means to set up straight. Oh, so it's, watch this. It straightens us out. The word is the standard that straightens us out. So if I'm going crooked, it moves me back. That's a profit for me. And you, fourth, it's profitable for training in righteousness. It's profitable for training in righteousness. In other words, the skills to grow, life skills to grow in maturity. So what have we seen today? We've seen the warnings, general, specific, and subtle. We've seen how you and I are to respond. 
and I'll give it to you in a summary really quick for, for all of it, for us. What are we going to do for the 92nd year? That's the question. The year coming. And I'm going to give you the answer, which is how to respond to the warnings. It is to recommit ourselves individually and as a group to believing the word and living the word. And with that, I'll tell you, fight on all of it. Let's pray. Father, thank you. The four items that we looked at. Teaching. Correction. Rebuking. Growth in righteousness. Profitable from the inspired, God-breathed word. I get it. I know the folks get it. The warnings are there. All we have to do is look around. Sometimes we think everybody in church is a Christian. The reality is, based on what Paul wrote Timothy, they're not. I don't like it. Bothers me to think about it. But the fact is, I can't deny it because you said it. And these folks that are in all churches are the ones that we have to have discernment about. But your word, thank God, gives us that. And so as we believe it and apply it and live it, we're going to grow in righteousness and knowledge of you. That'll make us mature. And we can use it inside the church and outside in the world. The worst thing a church can do is to be naive and not heed the warnings. I pray for Olivet Baptist Church, for myself too, that going into 2022, we will be better individually and corporately at believing the word recommitting ourselves to it that shuts down and addresses the warnings what a valuable letter Paul wrote to a young pastor to a young church that were its members what a valuable letter you use today for Olivet Baptist Church and its members and its preacher. Present text command. Don't forget it. Keep reminding yourself. Keep looking for it. Difficult times. Difficult people. Be heads up about it. Stay away from them. Especially those that have a form of godliness. But no power. And recommit to your first love. You know, I'm going to do this right now. I'm going to just ask right where you're seated. I'm not going to ask you to come forward or nothing. But if you sense the Holy Spirit with that unction of, you know, going into 2022, Pastor, I'm going to recommit myself to the inspired word of God. To read it more, to study it more, to live it more. Would you pray for me? I'm just going to ask you to slip up a hand really quick and put it right back down if there's anybody. Yep, I see him. Wow. Okay. Wow. Father, more importantly, you see the hands. And you see the heart. That's the real issue. Those hands that went up and those that were watching on TV want to renew a re recommitment to your word. Not to the pastor, not to the church, to the inspired, God-breathed word. Help them to do it. Help them. We are frail. We have a fallen nature. We're weak. But when we recognize that and ask you for help, the Bible says it's the reverse. You, you admit your weakness and then you have your strength. 
because you come in alongside to help. Would you do that, Lord Jesus, for every person that lifted up their hands? And Father, I want to thank you and Holy Spirit and the Lord for giving me this text for today. Thank you for renewing even and reminding me of a place the word of God should be in my life. May I never forget the reality and be honest. Difficult times because of difficult people. But we can be more than overcomers because of your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. You know what I would like to do since um, we're going to leave? Can you guys give us a benediction song where we can stand and you can benedict us out? One, one quick announcement. I'm so sorry. I'm learning as I go. After the service, we have something in the back for you that will be handed out. Okay, um, so don't just up and leave. Get your surprise. Okay. Thank you. I say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I say yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you. God bless you. Have a great week.